from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Harry Turtledove doesn't just write alternate history. He lives it. In one version, he failed out of college his freshman year. In another version, he got his doctorate in Byzantine history. In the 1980s, Turtle Dove worked as a technical writer for the Los Angeles County Office of Education, and he began publishing novels in 1979, and he's been writing full-time for the past 15 years. Under several different names, or alternate names, I guess I should say, he's published about 70 books, 140 short pieces of fiction. These include fantasy, science fiction, alternate history, of course, and straight historical fiction. His audience is vast, both adults and young people. He's won the Sideways History Award for Alternate History, a Hugo for Best Novella, the Cook Award for Southern Fiction, and the Clement Award for Best Young Adult Science Fiction. In one of his novels, he actually wrote poetry as William Shakespeare. Pretty convincingly, I thought. In this universe and any other, please join me in welcoming Harry Turtledove. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, yeah, how I got that PhD in Byzantine history. You know, I mean, we often, you know, science fiction doesn't come naturally to people, or most forms of it don't. I mean, we needed to have a developed science before we could goof on it, which is what science fiction does. But alternate history, imagining how the present might be if the past were different, that comes naturally because people all have weird stuff in their past. And I would not be standing up here in front of you now talking about alternate history if it weren't for a couple of happenstances in my own life. So I'll talk about how I became an alternate historian. I was, when I was a kid, a red hot science person which led me, predictably enough, in the 1950s and early 60s to being a science fiction person also. And I wandered into a secondhand bookstore that I used to haunt one day. I was about 14 years old and picked up a copy of a novel by a writer I liked. The writer was L. Sprague de Camp, and the novel, which I had never heard of before that moment, was one called Less Darkness Fall. Some of you will know what this is. Probably more of you will think, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> OK, Less Darkness Fall is a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court kind of story that drops a modern, well, fairly modern, because it was written in 1939. Uh, archaeologist into 6th century Rome when Rome and Italy were ruled by the Ostrogoths and when the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire was trying to take it away from them. And the adventure in the story is, try, you know, is trying to see how much the modern archaeologist could change history. All right, and I got hooked reading this book. I started trying to find out how much of this DeCamp was making up, which turned out to be very little, and how much really happened. And I got fascinated. All right, I told you, I was a red hot science person, and I was sufficiently red hot enough to get into the California Institute of Technology. Ta-da. I was also insufficiently hot to stay there, as, as, <laughs> as Rod pointed out. I, in, in, in this version of the world as we know it, I flunked out most ingloriously at the end of my freshman year. There were several reasons for this. One of them was that calculus and I most famously did not get along, and calculus was tougher than I was. Uh, one of them was that I discovered that you couldn't 
play bridge all the time and still expect to pass your classes the way I could in high school. <laughs> uh, and a third one was that after getting obsessed with less darkness, well, I also got obsessed with Lord of the Rings, which had just come out in paperback at that time. Put that all together, and at the end of my freshman year of college, I was, shall we say, disinvited back. <laughs> All right, so as a result of this, I spent a year at Cal State Los Angeles getting my grade point average back up to the point where it was visible, A, to my naked eye, and B, and rather more relevantly, considering that this was 1968, visible to my draft board's naked eye. <laughs> and after that year at Cal State LA, I spent the next many years at UCLA where I got a bachelor's in history, a master's in history, and a doctorate in Byzantine history. You want fries with that? Ah, <laughs> uh, you laugh. It is amusing to you. Once upon a time, I think it was, you know, less funny to me. Um, and if it hadn't been for Spray to Camp, I wouldn't have known the first thing about dark, Less Darkness Fall, and I probably would have been able to earn a semi-honest living. Instead, I had to tell lies. All right. I, my dissertation ran later than it might have because I was writing it in parallel with the first novel that I wrote that sold, not my first novel, because I put an endless trash on paper, but the first one that sold. Um, I taught for two years at UCLA while the professor under whom I'd studied had a guest gig at the University of Athens. He came back, he would, <laughs> which left me A, unemployed, and B, engaged because while I was teaching at UCLA I met the lady that I'm now married to. This is always, you know, the, the, the prospect of my son-in-law the bum is always one that endears itself to prospective fathers-in-law as, <laughs> as, as, as some of you in, who, who were in similar shoes once upon a time may remember. Uh, I, I had to make a decision whether I felt like being an academic mercenary and moving every six months or every year or whatever or whether I just wanted to get a real job. So I parlayed my three years of fiction writing experience, you know, they, and my college degree into a tech writing job at the Los Angeles County Office of Education. They said you had to have three years of writing experience, and I did. They didn't ask me what my income was, so I didn't have to reveal to them that my income from writing in, the, in those three years averaged in the three figures, and if they didn't ask, I wasn't going to tell. All right, so let's take a look at what happened from my picking up that L. Sprague de Camp novel, Less Darkness Fall, in that secondhand bookstore all these years ago. If I hadn't done that, let's see, I wouldn't have the degree I have, I wouldn't have written most of what I've written. I would have written something. I'm sure of that because I already had the bug. I was, I was already trying to write. But it, I w it wouldn't be what I have written. I wouldn't be married to the lady I'm married to. I wouldn't have the three kids I have. I wouldn't be living where I am. Other than that, Picking up this random book didn't change my life at all. <laughs> so I mean, this is this this to me is, is the kick of alternate history. We all have stories like this. You think if I hadn't gone out with her, if I'd gone out with her instead, or you think if I hadn't been made late by that phone call, so I was going home when that idiot came up behind me and rear-ended me for you know and put me in traction for two months. How would my life be different? Would it be a lot different? Would it be a little different? Would it be different at all? We all have this urge to wonder about these things. And this is where alternate history gets its attraction because there are, you know, we think, all right, on the micro-historical level, the level I've been talking about, alternate history is really easy to conceive of. And from that, it's just about as easy to make the leap 
to what you might think of as macro history, and people have been doing it for a surprisingly long time. The first example of real, carefully developed alternate history that I can think of uh, was written right around the time of Christ. The Roman historian Livy was speculating on what would have happened if Alexander the Great hadn't died after he went off and conquered India and Persia. What would have happened if he then had turned west and tried to conquer Rome? Well, Livy was a good patriotic Roman, and Livy said that the Romans of the late 4th century BC would have kicked Alexander's butt around the block. My personal opinion is that Livy was an optimist of the purest ray serene, but never mind that. The, you know, the, the point is that this idea of playing games of what if in history is one of the earliest motifs of speculative fiction. Um, there were several novels in the 19th century wondering how things would have gone if Napoleon had won. And of course, the two big ones that are written about today in the United States are novels about different outcomes from the American Civil War, which is rightly seen as the great choke point in American history because we would have looked very different if any number of different things had happened between 1861 and 1865. We might be better, we might be worse, but we would be different, you know. Uh, and the other one that, of course, is written about very often, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I've done both of these in, in various permutations, I'm, you know, and I'm certainly not the only one. The other one, the other one these days is World War II because people like Ken Burns conceive of it as the most important event of the 20th century, which it wasn't, World War I was. But World War II has several advantages for writing over World War I. For one thing, it's closer. It's still within living memory, and when these novels started getting popular in the 60s, it was easily within living memory. Uh, and the other thing that World War II has are about as perfect a set of villains as you could conceive of. Because the Germans were really, really bad and they really, really lost. So, I mean, the, you know, this, this is the ideal outcome. We don't bother asking ourselves, well, just how good were the Russians under Uncle Joe? And the, you know, all right. And the, the answer to this is, I, I, I have to put this in the form of a, of a comparison. The measure of Stalin's damnation was that something close to a million people who had lived under Soviet rule picked up rifles and help the Germans fight the USSR. That's the measure of Stalin's damnation. The measure of Hitler's damnation is that everybody else in the world was willing to team up with Stalin to stop Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really, really scary. <laughs> All right, sliding back briefly to the American Civil War, um, probably the book that I am best known for and the book that let me quit my day job and try to tell lies for a living full time is The Guns of the South. Some of you may know it. For, the, for those of you who don't know it, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. This is a book that has on the cover, and I get, I, get to, I get to brag on this because this, this was a cover idea that I actually suggested to my publishers and my publisher said yes to, which doesn't happen every day, believe me. <laughs> um, and that, that's, that's part of this story, so bear with me. Um, it shows a photo 
excuse me, a, a painting adapted from a Matthew Brady photograph. The real photograph shows Robert E. Lee on the back steps of his house after the Civil War. He is holding his hat in his hand and he is looking like grim death. The adaptation of the photo, instead of holding his hat in his right hand, Robert E. Lee is holding in both hands an AK-47. All right, the question is, how did this book happen? And this is another one of those alternate history stories. Because I have been friends for many years with, and even occasional collaborators with, a real fine fantasy writer named Judith Tarr. And Judy and I have corresponded for umpty ump years. And this was back in 1988, before either one of us had email. And Judy sent me a letter doing one of the things that writers frequently do, which is to piss and moan about your cover art for an upcoming book. Judy said that the cover art for this book that she had coming out then was, and I, I, and I quote, as anachronistic as Robert E. Lee holding an Uzi. And I looked at that and I thought, that's a good line. <laughs> so I wrote back to Judy and I printed out my letter and I added a hand scrawled PS at the bottom of this letter. Who'd want to give Robert E. Lee an Uzi? Time traveling South Africans, maybe? If I write it, I'll give you an acknowledgement. And I looked at that and I thought, that's pretty good. I can do something with that. And as I say, this was just a hand scrawl PS on the, you know, on the bottom of this letter. There, it was not saved anywhere. Before I sent the letter off to Judy, I carefully made a Xerox of it and threw it in my idea file. A year and a half later, I was writing Guns of the South, you know, because I had a two-book contract and I was doing homework before then. So again, this was not a book that I ever intended to write. This was just one of those things that happened, and believe me, I'm glad it did, because with that advance, I thought, well, okay, I've got two years' worth of income saved up, Let's see if I can make a go of this as a full-time freelancer. So I quit my day job. That was scary. Then I told my mother I'd quit my day job. <laughs> that was scarier. I think that was probably the second scariest thing I've ever done in my life. Because my mother was, was you know, grew up during the Depression when you didn't quit a job that had things like a steady paycheck and benefits and all that good stuff to see if you could make a living telling fibs. But I did it, and that was 1991, and I'm still doing it, and I need to lose weight, so I mean, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm still eating. My, ch you know, my children still have shoes, which they occasionally wear. You know, I live in California. Um, and so that's, you know, I've, I've, been, I've been very, very lucky. Um, the, the, the one other thing that I want to do, I'll turn this over to questions in a couple of minutes, but I want to talk briefly about things that I have on the front burner because one of the things that I'm really excited about is a novel that my publishers, Del Rey, not, not Tor who were kind enough to fly me out here, but Del Rey said, we will pay you extra if you can get this done in time for us to put it out before the November elections next year. And I said, how much extra? And they told me and I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the working title is The Man with the Iron Heart. In real history in Germany at the end of the Second World War and afterwards, there was a sort of half-assed resistance movement to the American occupation. Uh, it was started late because the Germans didn't realize, really believe that defeat could happen to them and it was run, or rather not run, in the, in the typical Third Reich fashion of putting it under four different jurisdictions and letting them all squabble among themselves. You know, the SS had a piece of this, the Hitler Youth had a piece of this, the Army had a piece of it, 
Even the Luftwaffe had a piece of it, for crying out loud, just because Goering had to have a piece of everything. And so this was small, badly coordinated, with few resources, didn't work, didn't come close to working. So I thought to myself, what would have happened if the Germans had done it right? What would have happened if they started preparing a couple of years before VE Day? What would have happened if they started setting men and weapons and goodies aside? What would have happened if American occupiers, and also Russian occupiers, which makes things more interesting and also messier, couldn't drive down a road without worrying about landmines or Panzer Schrecks from behind a bush uh, a Panzer Schreck is the grandfather of the RPG that's so popular with insurgents everywhere these days. Or people, kept people driving trucks into, full of explosives into places where they aren't supposed to be and then touching them off. You know, all of these charming things. What would have, how would the United States and the Soviet Union have reacted to a serious challenge to the German occupation and from 1945 on? Any relevance to the present situation in Iraq is, of course, purely in the eye of the beholder. Sure it is. <laughs> I, I, you know, hey, I told you, I write fiction, right? But anyway, this is, this is why Del Rey was rash enough to be willing to pay me extra to get this book out, you know, out so they could publish it in October of 2008. So that is what I am busily working away on, and it's what I brought with me when I flew cross country to come here. And when I get back to the hotel tonight, I will probably add another few hundred words and we'll see where we go from there. All right, so by, by my clock, I've got somewhere between eight and 10 minutes. And so I will happily take questions for that time. Yeah, so people need to go, there are, there are microphones posted, so you need to go up so your voices can be recorded for immortality. <laughs> Sir. Uh, have, I saw in the, uh, the blurb, you've written something like 70 plus books. I think I've read at least 50 of them. Thank you. And Guns of the South was the first because that cover was so intriguing. Thank you. At that you. time I was heavily into the Civil War. Uh, the other th another thing that I really like about the way you have written so many of your things is your focus on really common people. I'm thinking like of the Balance series and, and the First and Second World War series. Now the question is totally different. When can we expect, <laughs> when can we expect another Turtle Taub book? Ah, all right, H.N. Turtle Taub. Turtle Taub was the family name before my grandfather anglicized it when he came to this country. Some people who haven't seen my beard and my nose ask me if I'm American Indian. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Oy, am I not. <laughs> um, and it's the name that I used for my straight historical fiction, which unfortunately sold less well than I would like. There is a straight historical novel called Fort Pillow out under the turtle, t uh, under the turtle dove name, which, is, which really is mine and is the name on my driver's license and passport, just in case people are wondering. Um, there will be another turtle taub novel probably out, well, let's see, I hope to finish it in about another month. Um, it'll probably be out then end of 2008, first part of 2009. It's about the Battle of Teutoburg Wald, the battle that in 9 AD that made it very plain that Germany was not going to become a part of the Roman Empire. And there, I hope there will be more straight turtle dove historical fiction. Turtle Taub seems to be right out for the moment. Yes. Um, I really enjoy your World War Colonization series and Thank are you, you. going to be are you going to be doing anything more on that timeline? Or? That, 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 that line seems to be done right now. If I get another idea, I'll write it, but right now that seems to be done. Okay. Sir, you spoke about your friendship with Judith Tarr and about the uh, El Sprague de Camp story, of, like the Connecticut Yankee in King mm -hmm. Arthur's Court. And those came together for me in one of my favorite of your stories, which you wrote with Judith Tarr called Household Gods. Thank you. And I would like to know if uh, you could speak to how the two of you worked together to come up with that story and uh, whose idea it was in the first place. Oh, okay. Whose idea it was in the first place, it was Fletcher Pratt's idea. Fletcher Pratt was Brady Camp's longtime collaborator. Uh, Fletcher Pratt, back in the 50s, got the idea for a historical novel, a fantasy novel, about a modern woman frustrated with the way things are in the modern world 
dropped back into the Roman Empire in the, in the second century AD who gets to see whether the, the modern glass is half empty or half full. Um, Pratt died before he could write the idea. I ran across it, Sprague de Camp mentions it here and there, and I thought, this is interesting. And I thought, you know, I, when, when I sent Judy an email proposing that we work together on this book, um, I said, do you think we can do this? Do you think you want to do this? Do you think we can stay friends after we do this? Which is always a relevant question when you're working with somebody, and we did. Um, the way we worked was, I wrote first draft. I'm, I'm a better plotter than Judy is. Judy, Judy did second draft. Judy is a better stylist than I am. And then we, you know, we both did little nitpicky things after that. And I, I had last call because I had pitched it to her rather than her pitching it to me. And I think I used last call on two paragraphs in the manuscript, which was, you know, so that's how that worked. Sir. Um, I just got done with the Settling Account series, and How Few Remain was kind of, uh, you know, gave some back history to it, mm -hmm. that World War I, II series. Are you going to do a book that maybe, you know, a decade, two into the future, uh, that will kind of follow those characters after the end of World War II? Uh, right, right at the moment, I have to give the same answer that I, that I did about the colonization books. The, right at the moment, that one looks done. I mean, you know, we, we, we have traced it up through World War II and its unpleasant ending. I don't see, you know, the, the point of doing an alternate Cold War. If I, if, I, if I ever do see the point of doing an alternate Cold War, then I'll play with it. But right now, no. Yeah. Um, there are lots of reasons why an author might write a book under a pseudonym. But the only case I can think of of a man beginning a series under a pseudonym and then ending it under his own name is one which you just did with the Chernyanko books. Would you explain what was happening there? All right. Um, the reason that I chose a pseudonym for the historical fiction has strictly to do with marketing and with chain store computers. I am going to grossly oversimplify. Um, OK, I, I, w I suspected, and I turned out to be right, oh boy did I turn out to be right, that the historicals would not sell as well as the SF and fantasy do. And so I wanted them under a pen name, because what chain store computers will do, they will order to what your last book sold. So suppose your first book is Great Sex on national television, and you sell 20 million copies of this book, okay? You with me? All right, suppose your second book is translating Etruscan for fun and profit. <laughs> you will sell 20, no million, copies. All right, suppose your third book is More Great Sex on Satellite TV. The chain store computers, being computers and much smarter than ordinary people, will order 20, no million, copies because that's what your last book sold. I did not want this biting me, so that's, that's why I had the pseudonym. Sir. Um, I've always enjoyed your books uh, because of the depth of not only the plot line, but also the characters. Um, Thank you. And it always seems that you have two or three series or just other books going at the same time. How do you keep everybody straight? Um, the best answer that I can give to that is because I have a goddamn retentive memory. <laughs> And the other thing is because, unlike you people, I am easily able to cheat because I have all this stuff on disk, and if I try to remember what color somebody's eyes are and can't, I can call it up and find out. <laughs> those, 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 those two together sum it up fairly well, I think. I have a kind of a follow-up question to that. I was wondering, given uh, the number of books that you've written, I want to hear a little bit more about how you balanced uh, working as a technical writer and raising a family and whatnot and uh, your writing. Oh, okay, well, all right. For one thing, I have been, I've been full-time since 1991, which helps a heck of a lot. For another thing, I'm married to a saint. <laughs> I mean, she, Laura has put up, you know, we've been hanging out together for going on 30 years now. I was married once before. Believe me, I know when I'm well off. 
and I am. I have standards of comparison. I am the luckiest guy in the world. Uh, so that and beating the children into silence occasionally when they were smaller <laughs> also worked pretty well. How, how, we, how are we running for time where we should be? Somebody, somebody is supposed to hold up. Ah, okay, I've got, I've got about another minute, so maybe. <laughs> Have you ever considered working with Eric Flint on his 1632 series? Is that an area that would interest you? Uh, Eric, Eric has not approached me on that. It might, it might be fun to play with. You know, the, the, one pro the one problem with that is that I haven't read them yet because I tend not to read a whole lot of other people's alternate history these days just, just for fear of idea pollution, yeah. you know? Sir. I, how do you um, how do you wind up choosing the people whom you work with uh, on the alternate history anthologies that you've edited? Uh, there are people who I think would do good stories. There are people who I think would deliver good stories on time, which is a relevant consideration. Um, sometimes there are people. You know, I mean, this you know, this is this is partly a scratch my back, you scratch mine, mine business. You know, sometimes there are people who invited me to participate in you know in their anthologies if they, if they meet the other criteria, which which you know which often happens. I think maybe one more, and then I'm going to have to bail. In writing and conceiving, uh, how few remain, and its marvelous successors. Did you derive any inspiration from McKinley Canners if the South had won the Civil War? You know, not. Directly, uh, the one th the one thing I d you know, because I hadn't read that I read that book when I was in junior high school, which you will suspect is some time ago now, <laughs> and had not read it since because it fell out of print. Um, the one thing that I ended up doing that was that was the same as he did was to have Woodrow Wilson as president of the Confederacy and Theodore Roosevelt as president of the United States when World War One rolls around because that's just too good not to use. Thank you very much, folks. I, I have, I, thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.